this is Leslie Kane, and you're listening to That UFO Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. Joining me on the show today is returning guest, investigative journalist, broadcaster, author, and one half of the outstanding Need to Know podcast with Bryce Sable, Mr. Ross Coulthart. Ross, a very good morning to you. G'day, Andy. How are you, sir? I'm very well. Listen, I, I could fill a thousand hours speaking to you on this podcast, but we don't have that. We've got minutes, not hours. So if you don't mind, Ross, we'll get right into it because you're a busy man. Um, you've you've been doing a lot of appearances recently and I've been trying to pick through those and I've got a few comments, quotes and things I want to ask you about in the short time we have together. Um, first off, you recently appeared on journalist and radio host Neil Mitchell's show out in Australia, and I found a few interesting quotes I uh, took away from that, and including, let's get right into it, the world will know within 12 to 18 months we have a non-human intelligence in contact with us, and separately you quoted, we will have an acknowledgement, and I would love as best you can, can you expand on how we get from this point where we are now, still awaiting legislation to go through that may or may not change things, to potentially a year and a half down the line? having that kind of acknowledgement. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you gave me that opportunity to respond to that particular question, Andy, because the comment that I made was very much in context. It was an if. If the key legislation passes the Congress, if we get the NDAA, the National Defence Authorisation Act, and the Intelligence Act passed with the UAP reforms in them that mandate that Congress be informed about the legacy UAP program, if it exists, of course, then I'm very optimistic that by the end of next year or the year following, early the year following, we'll have an idea of what's been going on. And that's because essentially Congress is mandating that this happen. My one worry, and and look, my good friend and um, uh, lawyer, mate, uh, Danny Sheehan has pointed this out very recently um, in his interviews with Stephen Bassett. The one hook, the one question mark in my mind is whether Congress is really serious about informing the public. Because I'm sure Congress will be informed, and I suspect something will leak from Congress regardless. I mean, I'm amazed Congress hasn't leaked already, frankly, because I know what's been said to very important intelligence committees, both in the House and in the Senate. And I know firsthand witnesses, people with direct knowledge of the legacy crash retrieval and reverse engineering program, have purported to express direct knowledge of that program and passed it on directly to the Congress. And that information has been taken under oath by both the House Permanent Select Committee for Intelligence and the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence. And frankly, I I mean, it's quite amazing because most things leak from Congress at some stage, but it's a credit to those two committees that they've actually kept the lid on it so far. But um, I think as the next 12 months goes on, you're going to see, I suspect, certainly more former senior public officials coming forward and um, uh, speaking publicly about what they know and what they think. And uh, I think also there's a, um, I think there's a real, um, there's a real question mark also about what will happen if there's any future hearings. Uh, if the intelligence community inspector general was ever put before a committee and just asked the one question, Mr. Monheim, we know that you've been investigating David Grush, despite the efforts of some on social media to suggest there's been no investigation. There very definitely is an ongoing investigation, and there has been for some considerable time into Mr. Grush's allegations, complaints. And uh, in order to um, verify Mr. Grush's allegations, there doesn't need to be any leaking of national security information. All the ICIG, the Intelligence Community Inspector General Thomas Monheim, would need to be asked would be, Mr. Monheim, sir, we appreciate you're operating under national security constraints, but you've now, and I'm told this is the case, he's been released from confidentiality obligations that meant that he couldn't discuss whether or not Mr. Grush's complaints were under investigation. Under oath, what would he say? I think he would truthfully have to answer that, yes, 
He has investigated Mr. Grush's claims, and the basis upon which he found they were credible and urgent was because he's already interviewed the legacy program witnesses that we're talking about, and they have independently corroborated what Mr. Grush says. One of the great um, bullshit canards that's being carted out by the trolls and the debunkers is that Mr. Grush has provided no evidence to substantiate his claims. This is, I think, a very devious and manipulative effort by sections of the intelligence community and idiots who don't know any better in the um, troll community to try and denigrate a good man who's coming forward with information. Mr. Grush has provided first-hand witnesses to the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community. Those witnesses have testified. The Intelligence Community Inspector General is aware of that evidence, and it was on the basis of that evidence that he then went to the Congress and said and made the finding that these complaints were and urgent. And I don't think I can say that any more clearly. Bottom line is, Congress already knows. The Inspector General Intelligence Community boss already knows um, the big question is, is the public going to get told? And on that, Ross, uh, one of your quotes you followed with is, I am talking to people who have seen these entities. I wonder, has the level of what folks will truly accept as proof or evidence in society, has that changed? And I wonder, will admissions be enough from whistleblowers coming forward? Do you think the public's going to need to see with their own eyes, bodies and craft before this can truly move on and move up a level? Yeah, in short. I mean, it's funny, actually. I want to say something, Andy, about the UFO community right now. I, I love and deeply respect the people who are as passionate as I am about getting to the truth of what lies behind this mystery. But there is a new phenomenon right now that I've really noticed in the last few months of really quite angry hostility. People are sort of taking it out on commentators like me and you uh, that, you know, essentially we just need to spew everything up that we know as fast as possible and, um, you know, full speed ahead, damn the torpedoes and who gives a shit about national security. And one of the classic examples that I want to talk about is I talked a few months ago about this large craft that I'm aware of that's had a building built over it. And people have just been hammering me online, basically saying, you know, you can't, you can't do that. You know, Coulthard doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. I do, actually. And more importantly, the amount of abuse that I've copped for, for basically not playing the game and just telling everybody everything I know. People do not understand, and they never will, that as a journalist, I'm obliged still to heed the laws of my country and to respect the laws of an ally like America. I'm not going to compromise an important national security asset. And um, I, I think to reveal the location of what I know, where it is, uh, would I think be reckless and irresponsible. And, uh, uh, you know, that's a good example. Um, and just on the issue of, you know, people saying, you know, what evidence is going to be enough? Frankly, at the moment, I don't know. I mean, I, I think the moment that the moment that people see a, a little green man and a you know, a craft from Zeta Reticuli. I'm sure UFO Twitter is such a hostile, toxic sewer at the moment that people will just all start shafting themselves and say, "Ah, it's all crap." You know, I don't care. I don't believe it. It's all a, it's all a hoax. I, I, I really, at the moment, I kind of agree with Adi Loeb, who's just taken a swipe himself at social media and and suggested, I think, that um, you know, sometimes UFO Twitter is its own worst enemy. Um, I don't know what would convince people. And I, I feel the same uh, frustration and anger sometimes at the obdurate obfuscation and evasion by sections of the Pentagon and the intelligence community. And it infuriates me, frankly, that Congress is allowing itself to be so shamefully manipulated right now. And the fact that there is a very severe pushback going on in Washington, D.C. to try and shut down for example, the uh, important, incredibly important legislation that's being put before the Congress. I don't think people realise, Andy, if, if this NDAA legislation gets stymied, if people like Mike Turner, the congressman, the very powerful congressman from Ohio, get what they want, you know, I, I just, I see disaster for any hope of disclosure. I really do. And I, I think so do the people that I'm talking to in the Congress. You know, we need this legislation. 
okay, it's imperfect. I do think there are faults with the eminent domain legislation. Uh, it's mm. you know it's it's had unintended consequences where you know people who are in possession of even purported meta materials are now really worried that the state might confiscate these meta materials from them. And uh, you know I don't think the people who drafted that legislation had that in mind. I also think there's a problem with the legislation in that. It gives the Presidential Records Review Panel the ability to make a decision about whether or not the public can be told anything. And that's a very, very yep. good point that Danny Sheehan's made recently. And I'd seen that point, but I hadn't really thought about its significance until the last few days. There is a serious possibility, if not probability, that if there is a records review panel, as is contemplated in this proposed legislation, they might, after their six months of deliberations, come to the conclusion that, well, heck, this is far too important a national security imperative. Wow, you know, maybe we are sitting on alien technology. Maybe that's true. And gee, we don't want our adversaries, Russia and China, to gain any strategic advantage. We should keep this confidential. Now, what's to stop them from doing that under this legislation? And so, I mean, I guess I'm answering your question in a very broad way, but I, I, I share people's pain and frustration about what's going on right now. I'm not sure what level of proof will convince people, but I don't even know if we're going to get there. Right now, I'm more concerned at the level of pushback and downright evil desire by people um, – in the uh, aerospace community, particularly private aerospace companies that have had far too much power for too long, who have essentially lied, criminally misled Congress, and consorted with members of the military and intelligence community to do so. If the allegations of David Grush and other people I've spoken to are true, obviously I've got no way of verifying them other than talking to corroborative witnesses, but if those witnesses are telling the truth, and I suspect they are, we're talking here about a monumental cover-up that, that, that most of the American legacy media has their head up their asses about and are completely ignoring. And that's another issue, that you know, you're still getting these tame articles from sycophantic reporters on mainstream legacy newspapers that are essentially allowing the Pentagon and the intelligence community to put a completely misleading impression across to the public. I mean, Bill Nelson from NASA, what a disgrace. I was so appalled with the way that he tried to suggest that David Grush just had a conversation with a friend who told him something about something hidden in a shed. That is utterly disingenuous and misleading and designed to mislead. We know for a fact that first-hand legacy witnesses have come forward to the Congress and to the Inspector General and corroborated David Grush's claims. Those witnesses have seen and touched craft. They're aware of and possibly seen biologics. That's important. That's key evidence. The big issue now is, are the public, is the public going to get told the truth about that? Or is Congress, on the recommendations of the Presidential Review Panel, going to conspire to try and put this all back into a box and cover it up, which I suspect they're going to try to do? I wonder, and I hope it doesn't come to this or that point, but like you say, I think it's a reasonable possibility. People like yourself who have done a lot of groundwork and a lot of digging over the last few years, people like James Fox, people like George Knapp, there's countless others, your Luis Elizondo's who has his book due to be published at some point once it clears review and all that kind of stuff. If that happens, is there any, any potential pushback from folks like yourselves given... You know more than I do. You know more than most of us in this topic, given the sources you speak to. Does that knowledge just have to then stay locked away in the head of Ross Coulter? Or is there a plan or potential movement where people like yourself can then look at a plan B? Is there even anything you can do in that sense? Look, I haven't thought about that, to be honest, Andy. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm aware of a lot of things that I can't talk about publicly. And as much as that pisses people off on social media, the trolls who go, oh, yeah, it's all crap, it's all crap, I don't really care. I mean, the bottom line is I'm under an obligation as a journalist to ensure that I heed the laws of my country, yours and America's. You know, people like Julian Assange are in prison right now because they didn't heed national security constraints. Um 
The simple fact is that if the American government chooses to classify what essentially is alleged to be an illegal criminal cover-up, it doesn't look good for the Constitution of the United States that they've chosen to do that. And I, I just, I guess I just don't believe that the Congress would allow that to happen. I mean, there are too many people now in the Congress who are aware of the full story. And believe me, the full story is pretty bloody horrific. When Lou uses words like sombre, he uses it for a reason. Um, you know, what's been going on is a disgrace. And... Um, you know, I, I, I wish I could talk more specifically about it, and I, I, I feel frustrated as a journalist that I just can't go, you know, blang, this is what I know. But the, the simple fact is that there are very, very good reasons why journalists have to protect sources and have to hold on to certain bits of information. And, and whether in the long run that all comes out, I don't know. I mean, mate, David Grush is alleged... And people are missing the point of this. David Grush has alleged that people have been murdered to protect these secrets. That's not an idle statement, I can tell you. You know, this is, I, I mean, I, it makes the whole thing, if true, makes Watergate, Iran Contra, and every other bloody scandal that's happened in the American government over the past 80, 90 years pale into comparison. The consequences and the implications of this are absolutely enormous. And i found out so much more since I interviewed David, uh, spoken to so many more people. And, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really worried that, that you've got a situation at the moment where the American media, to the main, with the exception of places like News Nation and a few other networks that are asking hard questions, in the main, most of the mainstream legacy newspapers that should be targeting investigative teams onto this, you know, there's a, there's a level of prima facie evidence that we're well past in terms of twigging the curiosity of an editor. Clearly, sections of the media are being got at. They're being discouraged from covering this story. Why? I want to take you back a few minutes before we move forward. You you brought up, and it was like you were reading my my sheet my cheat sheet here. Um, the the craft you mentioned, and that's been a talking point now for months. It was outside the US, um, in the podcast this podcast Discord chat. It's much more civil than it is online, and people were <laughs> discussing those. Uh, it genuinely is, and people were uh, quite nicely discussing that comment. And the debate, and it was all had very kindly, and you had some supporters, others a little bit more frustrated, was around why exactly you aren't allowed to say where the craft is. And I wonder, is that protecting sources? Or uh, what would happen if you came out today on this podcast and said, okay, Andy, you, no, the, no, no, the craft what, what, is in let, France? Let, let me tell you, I can't tell you the country it's in. It's not America. But what I can tell you is that the place where it is kept is used for another purpose that is a laudatory purpose that's as much in your interests in your country in the UK as it is in mine in Australia and as it is in America. So the simple reasons are that, you know, there are other uses for the place where this object is stored. And we could end up with a Storm Area 51 type oh, scenario if you came and, out and, and announced I can, it. I can tell you, mate, that would be a nightmare. Absolute nightmare. And, you know, it's um, funny. I, I mean, I, I know a lot of people think journos just publish and be damned. But, you know, <laughs> I've been in situations where I've known the identities of active intelligence operatives in countries overseas. And I've realized, Christ, if I published this, I could jeopardize their lives. So there is an element of source protection as well. I mean, I don't want the personnel in those facilities to be hurt. Uh, and it could. It could create an international incident. I mean, it's up to the US to make a judgment about, you know, if somebody like I know this, um, <laughs> I was laughing the other day because um, somebody said on Twitter, oh, yeah, yeah, Coulthard must be lying because he couldn't possibly know this. He's just a journo. And it's funny, you know, many is the time I've wished to myself, I wish I didn't know a lot of this stuff because as a journo, it's, it's actually a bit of an overwhelming responsibility to have to make these judgment calls. I wish, I actually frankly wish somebody in the US intelligence community would show leadership 
and develop a spine and go to the White House National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, and say, Mr. Sullivan, for God's sake, you know, let us put out some kind of a statement. Because we really are at that state at the moment. You know, so many people privately know what's going on. And I'm sorry to sort of talk in vague, oblique hints, but what's going on is pretty bloody horrifying and confronting and outrageous. And I know the White House knows about it. And there's being, I mean, the reason why, for example, I suspect Thomas Monheim, the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, put out such a, how do one say this politely, evasive response to the inquiries from the congressman asking about whether he was taking David Grush's allegations and complaints seriously. He didn't deny that he was doing an investigation, but he basically denied doing everything else that's within his powers. And I know for a fact he's doing an investigation because I've seen conclusive evidence in the last couple of weeks that his investigators are talking to people to investigate Mr. Grush's claims. Um, you know, I've been presented with absolutely incontrovertible evidence that the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community's investigations are ongoing. And so the only reason why he, as an executive appointed official, would be reluctant to speak publicly and admit what he knows is because the White House is putting a blanket on what people can say and what people can talk about. And I know this might shock people, but I'm actually quite sorry for the Pentagon. I feel sorry for Susan Goh, the PR person for the Pentagon, who has to try and put out all the fires on this because, frankly, I don't think the president is showing leadership right now. He's so distracted by his own personal scandals, he's not thinking about the implications of the gradual unfolding of the biggest story in human history. You know, if, if you were the US president right now and you were facing corruption scandals and uncertainties in the Congress about your continued leadership, and I think we're looking at that possibility, I'm hearing that the president's capability to continue to operate in, as president is seriously open to question. Um, wouldn't it be a great moment if he showed leadership and actually instructed his national security advisor to actually pick up the, the reins and say, listen, yes, this is what we know. Yes, it's been kept secret from you. Uh, yes, there are certain things that we're going to have to keep secret for national security reasons. We're not going to talk about X. But we can tell you, and I think they should, we are aware of a non-human intelligence engaging with this planet. And the reason I say that they should say that is because I know the evidence is incontrovertible. On that, Ross, so even, and you recently, uh, your statement you made on the Word Games, I think, episode of Need to Know, you said, and I'll paraphrase, I, I actually have huge respect for any military person who's basically saying the national security could be compromised. Maybe they are knowing something that we don't, and we need to accept and acknowledge that, which is sort of what you're saying there. Um, and you, you finished that by saying, because frankly, there is evidence, you know that's a flat out lie. There was more to the statement, but I wonder, given what you've said there, even if we do get that acknowledgement, some kind of acknowledgement from a spokesperson in the US government, given the decades of lies and deceit on the subject beforehand, how much stock can we put in anything that they do come out and say, especially in this day and age? You know, it's funny. I was listening the other day to the fact that the public confidence in government in the United States, I think 20 years ago, it was 33%. And it's now down, I think it was 16%. And, you know, that's America. I think in your country and mine, I think public confidence is a lot higher. And I'm really confronted. I'm actually very confronted when I talk to people, including people in uniform and people in the intelligence community in the US. There's a despondency about the state of government in the US. I mean, God, they've just sacked a speaker for the first time in their history. You know, you know, the, the Congress is riven, stricken with, with uh, division. You know, there's extremes on both sides. It, it's really sad because we've never needed unanimity more and leadership more from the United States than right now. And I know I probably sound like a scratchy record on this, but, you know, I'm talking to people who are monitoring the slowly un unravelling situation with China right now and the Ukraine situation with grave worry. You know, the, we've never been in a more dangerous situation before than we are now with the risk of nuclear war. I mean, it's, 
absolutely terrifying. And, and as a boy, as a teenage kid, I, I grew up with the constant threat during the Cold War, the expectation I wasn't going to make it to 20 because I genuinely thought I was going to die in a nuclear blast. So I, I became a punk with spiky hair and Doc Martin boots and just lived my laser days out listening to Susie and the Banshees and the Clash. And I really so, honestly didn't expect I was going to make it to my 20s. And the, um, the, the thing that really shocks me now is – with this, this kind of cognitive dissonance right now where, you know, as far as I can see, the greatest country in the world, the, the most powerful leadership country in the Western Alliance, the United States, is distracted in a really serious way. And, you know, it's got its economic problems. It's got looming crises with the clashes over Taiwan, constant issues with North Korea. There's the ever-present risk of a conflict in the Middle East with Iran because they're developing a nuclear weapon. Uh, and, and we've got the Ukraine, you know, the possibility that a madman like Putin might use a tactical nuclear weapon to stop an invasion of the Crimea. And in the middle of all of that, we've got the biggest story in human history unfolding where an intelligence officer like David Grush and numerous, dozens, Michael Schellenberger's set up to 30 to 50, of other witnesses have come forward with evidence to the Congress and also to the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community with direct evidence of an illegal, probably criminally operated program going on inside the United States and outside its borders. And um, <laughs> I just find it amazing, absolutely amazing, that it's just not getting the traction that it deserves. People are so distracted. And, and so I... I don't know where it's going. I really, I can't look at my crystal ball and make a prediction, to be honest, mate. But I'm very, very glum and pessimistic right now that we're either head, head, heading towards a, an international crisis. Um, and, and frankly, the best way to show leadership, what a great thing to pull the world together right now, would be for somebody to stand up at a lectern at the White House and say, ladies and gentlemen, We are not alone. Imagine that. It, the world would stop for a moment and take pause. Because the Russians and the Chinese know we're not alone. <laughs> I mean, they do. You know, they're, they're in the same position the US is. We've recovered craft, allegedly. Um, and why the, you know, three most powerful countries on the planet conspire to keep this all a secret from the public is beyond me. I've never been given a good reason. I wonder, in your opinion, given what you know, again, I've said that a few times, I understand, are there elements of this, and this might be a controversial question for some, for folks who are frustrated, but are there elements of this secret that the gatekeepers of secrecy are right to keep from the public, in your opinion? Yeah. I mean, if, if for example, it's true that they've salvaged craft, let's assume for a moment that they've mastered some kind of positive lift propulsion system, maybe anti-gravity. One of the things that was described to me was that the, the, the capacities of an anti-gravity system are such that you could obliterate the planet. You know, the, 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 you know, if you can draw unlimited amounts of free energy from the quantum vacuum, if it really is the case that you can develop positive lift using technologies that you, we don't quite yet understand in modern physics... Um, the implications of, our, of that are enormous, weapons of war. And I mean, think about this. It's already been an allegation from key people, including I think Lou Elizondo and others, that there's been kinetic engagements with UAPs. So what are we using to bring down those UAPs? I can only speculate, but imagine if it was an electromagnetic pulse of some kind. Imagine if we're using EMP technology, some kind of directed beam technology. You know, there are a lot of things that I can imagine the United States and other governments might want concealed because they are. I mean, they're in a, as David Rush said, a, a new Cold War, a, a new race to try and master technologies, non-human technology. And the, the simple fact is that whoever wins, whoever gets there first, effectively controls the next unlimited number of years. I mean, the potential, you know, it, it is awesome 
technology. Something, if you if you even just look at the basic data and accept that, yes, it is possible without any visible means of propulsion to make an object the size of several football fields lift off the ground and accelerate at hypersonic speeds, hyper you know hyperluminal speeds. Um, that's a technology that is absolutely mind blowing. And I can understand why a government would want to keep that secret. What I don't understand, what I truly do not get, is why we're going through this silly game of pretending that there is no credible evidence of extraterrestrial life engaging with this planet. That is a steaming pile of bullshit. It really is. It's just complete bollocks. They've got an abundance of evidence, not just on the, um, in, the, in the confidential files. I mean, there's an overwhelming degree of evidence in the uh, publicly released information. I mean, at what degree, what point do you accept that witness evidence is compelling? Have you ever had, in, in all the folks you've spoke to that have come forward, has anyone ever claimed to have flown in anything potentially that's been back-engineered from non-human technology? No. Is that but something I've, that I've, tends I've, to have been... I've heard these allegations from certain people who claim to have been part of a secret space program and... Frankly, I've, I've never investigated that, and I don't know what to make of it. I do note, though... I wonder... I, get- I, I do note, though, that Michael Schellenberger, who I, I respect and I think is extremely well-informed, and I suspect he and I are talking to some of the same people, I do note that Michael Schellenberger has said that the United States has... I think he said that they'd reversed-engineered a triangular craft which is a, a claim that he made in one of his most recent articles, which I just thought, wow, and I, I really think that's a significant moment. Because if that's true, then, you know, way back when um, Chris Mellon, for example, was a senior staffer on the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence, what, 30 or 40 years ago, and he was asked by Senator Robert Byrd to investigate the truth of allegations that um, uh, there was a TR-3B seen over the North Sea by a, a guy who was an aviation expert. Um Imagine if he was lied to. Imagine if way back then, 30 or 40 years ago, the premier committee in the Congress that was tasked by a very senior senator to investigate the truth of allegations that the United States was in possession of non-human technology. Imagine if the Congress was lied to that long ago. See, that's the issue here, my friend, is that there's been enough stuff on the public record to make you have cause for pause. You know, people have seen stuff for years, for decades. And if there's been this cover-up, if there's been this lying going on where certain individuals in the intelligence community and the defense community have essentially conspired with sections of private aerospace to criminally, illegally conceal stuff from congressional oversight, well, not only should they be tarred and feathered and dragged around Washington, D.C. and stoned behind a Humvee, they should also be named and shamed. You know, and this is what they don't want. So this is why there's a pushback going on. You know, why would, um, oh gosh, let me guess, Northrop Gummon, uh, Lockheed Martin, why would companies like that want to reveal what they've got sitting in their cupboard? Yeah. I mean, and also, I mean, mean this this is the broader issue. They're publicly listed companies. You're on the stock exchange. So people have bought and sold their shares, never being told issues that are materially relevant to their share price. Imagine if you're a shareholder and you find out after the fact that, say, oh, gosh, Lockheed Martin had a uh, priceless piece of non-human technology hidden in its basement for the last 60 years. And imagine if you were allowed to sell those shares without ever being told this materially relevant information pertinent to that share price. It would be the biggest class action in world history. Every shareholder who's done their dough on Lockheed Martin would want to go and sue. So this is why there's a lot at stake here. I mean, this is why I do think there's going to have to be some kind of um, amnesty and some kind of um, reconciliation, truth and reconciliation commission, where people are essentially given an undertaking of amnesty in return for a truthful reporting of what actually happened. But I'll I'll tell you honestly, mate, I'm... I've become privy just in the last few weeks to allegations that are <laughs> shocking. I mean, even I, even I'm amazed. You know, I know I'm the guy that David Grush told he was aware that people had been murdered. You know, he he'd been informed that people had been murdered to protect this secret. Um, 
Imagine if there were things that are worse than that that the United States might want to conceal. That's, that's What's what really worse what... than a fate, worse than death? I know, I know. It's bloody horrible. And, and, and you know, this is why it's a, for, for anybody, but particularly for Joe Biden, I can see why, you know, if you look at the Schumer legislation, it's actually quite clever because let's assume the NDAA laws are passed in December as they usually are. They've got about 45 days, I think, to get the chairman and then set up the nine-member review panel committee. And then that committee will start its hearings and it has six months to make its decision Mm. and make its recommendations to the president. So let's say it's around about this time next year, September next year, that the president, and if that's Joe Biden, the president is basically asked to um, look at the review panel's report. I can see the president going, you know what, I'm just going to put this on the back burner. We're about to go into caretaker mode for the presidential election. Let's just put this on the back burner and wait until after the election. I suspect the whole Schumer amendment is an attempt to try and buy time because people are freaking out that um, Joe Biden's weak at the moment. He's essentially crippled. And so, so frankly, is Donald Trump. You know, there are a lot of people in the intelligence community who are really worried about Donald Trump having this information. And um, I think they'll shelve it until after the election and leave it to the new president, whoever he or she might be. I was speaking with Joe Murgia online and I happened to mention to him, I kept this relatively quiet. I was speaking with you tonight, no hyping. And uh, I asked him if he had any questions for you because I respect Joe. And he asked him, with the alleged injuries or deaths at the hands of UFOs and their occupants, from Ross's understanding, was it just people being in the wrong place at the wrong time and getting injured from tech or radiation? Or was there any reports of aggressive behaviour on the part of non-human intelligences? I'm sorry to um, upset anybody out there, but no, I'm, and I remember this moment very clearly in my conversation with David Grush and also with other people. No, I'm talking here about malevolence. I'm talking here about deliberately targeted attacks by you know, alleged non-human intelligences uh, that weren't accidental, that they were deliberate acts of murder, killing, and mutilation. And would it be fair to say, though, that given we have heard, and you've spoken today about reports of us shooting down these craft or objects, that could either be retaliation or just an expectation that that's what they do? No, again, um, this is what I find is a real worry is um, I'm increasingly led to the view by sources that the United States has been involved in targeted kinetic engagements with UAPs using EMP weaponry to try and bring them down, and they've done so successfully. So that's an offensive act against a non-human intelligence. If that's true, and I'm not saying it is true, it's just something I've been told that I'm still in the process of trying to verify with other sources. If that's true, The implications of that are that one country in the world has taken offensive action against a non-human intelligence, which is perhaps of a vastly superior advanced technology. What are the implications for that for the entire human race? And what right do they have to do that, if true? Well, Ross, we're running out of time and I just want to finish up Uh, and this might tie in quite nicely because you've just tweeted out about an hour and a half ago. um, Heads up, I'm recording a news special investigation with News Nation next week exploring the still unexplained February UAP shutdown incidents over the US and Canada and you've asked people to send you over questions in that thread which is fantastic that also links into I've got your new revised and updated copy of In Plain Sight Uh, I would recommend anyone go and pick that up but just very quickly why the new chapters I don't think it's a spoiler to say one of them is around those shutdowns that happened back in February great to see it all brought back together what was the thinking okay I'll bring you into my tent a little bit Andy I got told a while back by reliable multiple sources that I should take a much closer look at the Alaska shootdown. I'm told we haven't been told the full story about that particular incident. 
Uh, I'm told that in all probability, the Yukon object and the Lake Huron object were in all likelihood benign, prosaically explained objects. But I'm Mm. told that there is a real question mark over the Alaska object. And moreover, I'm also told that there were earlier UAP incidents that month that have not been disclosed by NORAD. That's what I'm exploring. And I think it's incredible to me. I mean, you think about this, mate. The the journo in me, I just, you know, I'm trained to look for red flags, okay? And I just do not understand why the media in the United States just lamely accepted a press release that came out on the 17th of February from, I think, Mm. NORAD, asserting that, oh, gosh, we've now done an exhaustive investigation after several days of searching and we can't find a thing. Very sorry, can't yeah. tell you any more about these objects. Oh, and by the way, we can't release any vi- any imagery or any videos. And oh, by the way, we can't tell you why. J- just trust us, we're the Pentagon. Really? I mean, I I think what happened to the days when journos asked questions and dug? That's what I've been doing. I've been digging into the Alaska shoot dance, and I can tell you, it's very very interesting. And that's oh, what we way, can catch soon yeah. on News Nation, yeah. Yeah, and if people want to ask, want me to, you know, answer certain questions, um, I, I'm going to have a slot in the show for answering questions. So drop me a question either on um, X messages or um, uh, my uh, email address is on my Twitter handle. Uh, get in touch with me. Send me an email detailing the question you want answered, and I'll try and answer it. Awesome. Well, Ross, listen, I'll advise folks, grab a copy of the revised and updated version of In Plain Sight, especially if you've never grabbed the first one. I I read the new chapters and I read them in your voice, Ross. I don't think it's possible to read the book without reading it in your voice. Um, The audiobook's just as good. And don't forget to catch Ross and Bryce Zabel on their podcast, Need to Know. Ross, once again, thank you for your time. It's a real pleasure, Andy. And can I say, you know, mate, I just love your Scots accent. I, I, I grew up a Scots boy. My daddy was a Scotsman. I love it. Absolutely love it. What part of Scotland are you in? Uh, oh, I'm from Glasgow, but I live in the northeast of England. Uh, but obviously, if people want to hear more of the voice, they can sign up to my OnlyFans account and I'll read them whatever passage from any book of yours, Ross, do you like for <laughs> the pricely sum of $50. <laughs> Good on you, mate. Nice to talk to you. That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, U-A-P-A-M. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer, a little Baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shoved out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoke. The game is dateful on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. Like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. I jumped back and nearly kissed myself. Then I climbed out the window after the elf. And I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head. And everything was weird and everything was red. And I helped out my boys. They thought this was noise. They thought it was a dream. They thought it was my toy. They thought it was my problems and they think I should take care of me and I don't know what it is because it doesn't really scare me. Consider your heart, consider time, consider your space, consider
consider your lies, consider your life, consider